share the screen. Go. All right, so desktop Q4. So yesterday we did transformers. Any questions about that stuff? Pretty basic in comparison to what we were looking at before, maybe, but could still have some questions. Anything? Yeah. I was just wondering the homework was. Um, like, I think this is maybe question three. Like, do you want to have it up or can I just go ahead? Or I'll go, I'll grab it here. 26 Transformers Answers Notebook. That way it's easy for everybody to see what's going on, what I'm saying, and so on. Number three, you said? Uh, yes, from the practice set. Okay, it's coming up here. All right, I think it's loaded there. Yeah, 26 homework answers, one, two, and three. Um, so question number three. Uh, well, I guess, you know what, I have to, uh, I have to load the lesson too, I guess, because that's where the questions are, but I can just do this maybe quicker. Um, I think I did the wrong homework then. Oh, did you do um, pages from the For You book or something, or what? I don't think so, but they were just different. I looked at like the lesson 26 PDF, but maybe I picked the wrong page or something. Like uh, they were about transformers. Okay, so this this is the textbook pages. And so what what page number is it you're asking about? And number three of it? So this is um, page. I think it's, it was on like 342 or something. Okay, so 742? That's what I mean, yeah. Okay, fair enough. So is it um, is it this number three, like the this one, generator the hydroelectric facility? Yeah, that number three. That's the one. Okay. Yes. I probably gen- wasn't supposed to do that. Uh, I kind of think maybe it was one of the assigned questions. Let me just check, take a look here, because there's sort of two. It, that, this textbook has that confusing, like it has two sets of one to three, right? So there's like section review one to three, and then there's Practice problems one to three. So let me just load up the actual lesson here, which is this one. And it does say practice problems one to three. Yeah, yeah. So it's practice problems one to three, and then section review one number one. So I tried to be clear there about which one. So practice problems one to three. So anyways, we have a generator. Uh, it's producing a voltage of 750 essentially, um, and then that's stepped up to you know, six times 10 to the five. So six with five zeros after it. So call that whatever you want, 600,000 or whatever it is. I'd have to draw it out to make sure. Um, at the town, it stepped down to this amount, an electrical substation, and then stepped down again to uh, the 240 for your house. Um, they should say in, in your neighborhood, like directly for your house, really, right? At least in our area. If the total current available from the transformer in your neighborhood is uh, this many amps, um, then find out uh, what the current that must be transmitted at each stage of the journey and assume 100% efficiency. So I remember answering this one, so it must be in here somewhere. Um, that's the page that I want. I want the homework answers, which is in the notebook file. Um, so that must be. Remember doing this, but this doesn't look right. This looks like this looks like the electromagnetic induction homework. Did I do something wrong with my saving somewhere? Hmm. Let's see. I saw. I noticed that there was a. What did I do? I noticed that there was a homework answers copy, and I thought that was kind of weird. Homework answers transformer homework answers copy. Let's try that one. Because that's just the induction homework there. That's why we're you're confused there. But it doesn't look like what you're supposed to look like, right? Yeah, I wasn't sure if like I did the wrong stuff or it just hadn't been uploaded yet. I don't know. I'm maybe confused myself here. Let's see if I have the right stuff here. I've got a paper copy still from when I did it. So if I screwed up the files, I can still. Yeah, it looks like 
So that's the induction homework, isn't it? So if I go up to induction PDF. It must not have posted. Well, yeah, I'm going to have to just post that, I guess. Um, I'll have to take a picture of and post it, but it'd be better not to do that right now. So why don't I do that? I'll, I'll clear, I'll clean that up. I'll make sure the induction homework is the induction homework and make sure the transformers homework is actually the transformers homework. I must have just pasted, saved the wrong file as that new name. Is that okay? So I'll post that. But you're going to see, um, you're going to see basically in this question here, identify where the current is happening. And so they're saying the current in the neighborhood is that. So you're like, okay, the current uh, when we're at the 240 volt stage is this, and then think of how that steps um, each time, right? So the volt, if the voltage is stepping up, you know the current is stepping down, right? And so you just have to go through multiple steps. Um, but I'll post that solution to keep this efficient. That makes sense. Nice. Yeah, that's great. I was just didn't really understand the wording, but I'll be fine when I see the answer. Yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah, okay, yeah, for sure. Um, just basically, you're going to have like three stages where you're going to have pairs of voltages, like um, starting voltages and final voltages, like uh, primary voltages and secondary voltage. Um, and so on each each stage of the journey in the neighborhood and then at the substation and then at the generator itself, there's a there's a conversion there where you're talking about a multiple, right? And so if you're multiplying the voltage by a thousand, then you're dividing the current by a thousand and you just sort of work your way back. Um, to what the original would have been. You'll see, it'll, it'll make sense when you see the actual solution rather than the electromagnetic induction stuff. But if not, we can Yeah, I think I did that, but <laughs> I just, yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah, ask again later once you see the solution, but let's go with uh, standard model. So this is the, um, the uh, watching the nature channel and, and learning about uh, foreign species you know, it's kind of interesting to do that, right? And you see birds you've never seen before. Well, today you're going to see subatomic particles you've never heard of before. Um, so think of it as the same sort of thing where you just kind of gain a, a general understanding of, of what they call the standard model. Um, and it's physicists model of the universe that we we think is fairly complete at this stage. But we're always as physicists are always looking for for more information, looking a little deeper. Um, so, for example, just to set the stage, we know, um, you know, at, at one point they sort of realized that that everything's made up of atoms, right? And then atoms of certain types. We know there's like 118 on the periodic table, different types of atoms. And then we learned a little more, and we found that the atoms made up of like neutrons and protons and electrons. Protons and electrons first, and then neutrons were discovered later by Chadwick. Um, and then physicists started to discover that protons are actually made up of even smaller things called quarks and 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 so on and so on and, and it and it goes from there okay so we're talking about all those all those uh, different types of, uh, of particles like electrons and protons and quarks and neutrinos and and so on um, so hopefully this gives you an overall picture uh, to help you with that question like what the heck's a neutrino if you hear about neutrinos or what the heck's a you know any of these particles okay so I um, recall that we talked about the four fundamental forces of nature um, going from strongest to weakest. The weakest, or like I'll just start with the weakest because it's most familiar, right, is the gravitational force. The strongest is that strong nuclear force. Okay, those are the easy ones to sort of pin on the on the outer edges of this hierarchy of forces. In the middle, um, you've got the electromagnetic force is, is pretty darn strong. Um, and then the weak nuclear force isn't quite as weak as gravity, but it's, you know, so that's maybe if you're trying to help yourself remember the order of those. Um, yeah. The ends are for sure labeled. And then remember the weak nuclear force, if you're comparing the other two, it's weaker than the electromagnetic, so it helps you place them in order. Anyway, so we've got these four fundamental forces, right? And we're going to, as part of the standard model, we're going to talk about how these forces work and what particles they affect. Um, as part of this. So we're going to figure out all the different particles essentially that the universe is made up of and also talk about the how the forces between them um, exist and how, how it happens. So I don't need that. Do I need to leave this page right now or not? Are we going on? I think we're going on because we've talked about that before. And it's there for you as a record later on. No one's keying their mic. So here we go. 
Um, so in studying the details of gravitational and electromagnetic uh, forces, it's hard not to notice major similarities, right? This is a summary of what we've done, right? We know, like, think of the uh, force of gravity as GMM over R squared. Force of uh, electric force between two charges is KQQ over R squared. There's major similarities. Um, as a result, scientists have investigated the possibility that other forces might share common characteristics. Um, and then there even might be... Uh, they might, they might all be like a result of like a one common force. Um, so these four forces, um, in fact, originally I should add to, they, they had, they studied electricity forces and they studied magnetic forces separately until they finally realized they were part of the same force. And that's what they're kind of trying to do with all of these forces. So they're trying to get like one big equation that, that would encompass all of this stuff, depending on what kind of variables you plug into it. Okay, so if you're plugging like big mass numbers into things, you're looking at the gravity force. If you're plugging charge numbers in, you're looking at the electromagnetic force. But as of right now, we got these like separate equations for these separate realms of physics. Um, but it's it's thought that they're kind of possibly all part of obviously one universal equation. Um, that's what they refer to as the grand unified theory or the, the TOE. So it's either the GUT, the grand unified theory, or the TOE, which is the theory of, theory of everything. Um, and that's what they mean. Like they mean like a theory that would, an equation that would mean, all, that would give you uh, values, allow you to make predictions to do with all of these forces and particles and their interactions. Um, so uh, the study of the, all this forces and fields and particles and so on, um, the standard model was developed and and attempts to unify all these forces or at least attempts to explain all of them right when you're going beyond the standard model that's when you're going to the grand unified theory more so uh in general this theory has been super super successful um, explaining interactions um except for gravity which actually seems to be a bit of an anomaly so it seems odd i think to me and probably every other human that's a gravity the one we feel like we're most familiar with is actually the one that they've had the least success in, in explaining um, I'm just going to modify this page a bit here. Um, I'm going to say attempts to explain these forces, forces and interactions and so on. And then, yeah, let's just leave it at that. Um, so moving on here, um, the fundamental part of the standard model, of course, is that these exchange, these uh, forces have exchange particles. So they actually visualize like little particles getting exchanged back and forth between, um, say, uh, between two masses. There's like invisible particles that are being exchanged back and forth. And that's how these masses can exert forces on one another over distances, like the whole action at a distance um, uh, force without contact business is explained. Now, explained is in quotes there. Because it's it's a it's a mathematical representation that that's consistent and it leads to predictions that are consistent with observations, so it's explained mathematically and scientifically, um, but the idea of of the interaction is still still kind of weird. It's not super uh, I'm not necessarily thinking we've explained it well yet here at least in class. Uh, so the electromagnetic weak and strong um, are transmitted by particles. This is our first sort of um, when I'm talking about a category of particles um, and you're going to see soon sort of a summary of all the different types of particles. So yeah, um, they're, they're bosons or gauge bosons. And uh, so they're going to have slightly different characteristics depending on which one we're talking about, right? So if we're talking about um, the electromagnetic, we're talking about photons are the particles that bounce back and forth. Um, the strong force is the gluons. Right, so the sense of humor used there for gluing the nucleus together, the gluons, um, and the weak force has uh, what they're referred to specifically as vector bosons, the W and the, the W uh, plus minus, and then the Z boson. Um, and the uh, gravity force should have a, a particle called a graviton, not gravitron. That's a ride at an amusement park. So graviton. Um, but experimental evidence is 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 kind of not working out the way they think it should um, for the graviton. So um, the the uh, it's, it's kind of a problem, right? That that 
gravity is doesn't seem to be working out the way they think it should based on uh, on a, a model to do with exchange particles um so definitely a nobel prize out there for someone who manages to sort of piece that all together so uh let's keep going for a little bit um so exchange particles if you're if you're jotting down any kind of notes at all to help yourself remember this you know like basically remember the bosons are are our exchange particles are bosons um now just to clear up clear up uh, any confusion here that, that I've certainly had anyways, not all bosons are exchange particles. It's just that exchange particles are in that category. So you have some bosons that, that aren't, aren't ex exchange particles also. All other particles, electrons, protons, things like that, um, they're fermions. So fermions are, are the stuff that makes up the universe uh, that we that we see, okay? So fermions, are the category of particles um, that make up the stuff we see. Stuff we see in the universe. Because these exchange particles, of course, are um, universe. Uh, exchange particles are kind of hidden, and and we realize that they're there, but that that took a lot of uh, scientific uh, discovery and analysis and mathematical work and so on. Like they're they're. You know, you could almost, I don't know if it's the right word, but you could almost think of them as, as theoretical particles because we can't really actually see them very directly, but they're more than just theoretical particles because we can see them directly scientifically with, with experiments. Um, but you can't hold in your hand and, and see what it looks like, right? Anyways, um, so we're going to tackle this bit by bit and there'll be some repetition along the way here, but um, so fermions, um, there's leptons and quarks, and um, leptons, for example, is an electron. So example here. For example, electron um, is a lepton, and quarks are what are making up the, they, those are what make up a proton. So I'm just giving you some examples here and neutrons. So, uh, and then, so we're gonna, again, piece some of that more together in a second here, but um, there's also in the in the category of um, cat particles and so on, there's also baryons, which are made up of quarks also. Um, I should point out here, for example, here, protons are two up quarks and a down about the different types of quarks yet, but we're going to try and piece this all together. So quarks make up protons and neutrons for sure. Um, also, they make up baryons. Um, in the boson category, we've got the force carrier particles, the exchange particles, but we also have mesons, which are bosons also. So just again, just take this all in as like a overall idea for now and be like, okay, there's different categories of particles and there's categories within the categories. These are all categorized to be based on like how they behave and, and how they interact. So just to try and give you a little bit of a better picture of this, this flow chart helps a little bit. Um, so we're like, okay, in terms of, uh, and I'm throwing in some other ones as well, warning here, but in terms of fermions, um, you've got uh, leptons. Remember I said electrons and a lepton. So there's electrons, there's muons, there's tau particles, okay? Um, to do with leptons, there's electron neutrinos as well. There's muon neutrinos and tau neutrinos. So there's actually three kinds of leptons, electrons, muons, and tau particles. Um, and uh, so the ones we are most familiar with, of course, are electrons, but that doesn't mean the other ones don't exist, right? Um, in fermions, uh, they the other category I didn't mention, the other one is they call them hadrons. Um, so hadrons are the baryons and the mesons. The baryons, remember, are the protons and the neutrons, as I said before. And then mesons are another category. Let's see how I, I have to get to the page where I talk about quarks, but there's up quarks and down quarks. That's what all this Q, these Qs are. So mesons are made up of two quarks. Protons and neutrons are made up of three. And then over here, those gauge bosons are your exchange particles. Okay, so your photons, your gluons, your gravitons, your your vector bosons for the like, for the uh, the weak nuclear force. So you've got the, the this I should add on here. This is the gauge particle for electromagnetism. This one's for the weak 
and this one's for the strong force. And this one, if we find it, um, is for gravity. Okay, those are your exchange particles. So that's, you know, that's a, a flow chart that kind of organizes all, all matter. And so we're going to come back to this one again and remind you of it once we've gone through a little bit more details of some of the particles. But I wanted to give you like an overview of what we're tackling just to as a, an idea um, and then come back to it to say, OK, remember, we looked at this. We've seen all these bits and pieces now. So before we get to that, just want to sort of back up a little bit and talk about, you know, how we sort of discovered some of this stuff. Um, and so um, this 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 is the, a link to a, a good uh, resource, but it's there's so much information. Um, so we're going to go through to instead of having you have you try and hunt through all this information, I'm going to try and carry you through a lot of the information bit by bit. So if you ever wanted to research more, look into it more or, or whatever, you could go to the source of the information here. But this is this, they just have a, a lot of good information, but man, it's hard to weed your way through it. Uh, so, of course, the the fundamental questions that led to a lot of this is like, what's what's the universe made up of? What holds it together? Why do why do objects attract? Why do charge some charges repel? All these kind of things, right? It's like physically, like what's the world made up of, and and how do all the forces to do with it work? Um, so even starting out way back in the day, you've seen this before. I'm not going to stay on this page long. You know, the earth, fire, air, water stuff. You know, the, the fundamental ideas of when we first started investigating um, what the heck things are made up of around us. So this isn't a new concept. It's just the physicists have gone pretty far down the rabbit hole in, in figuring out what things are made up of. So uh, the first level that chemists and scientists have got to was the idea of the atom. And I'm just bouncing through this because this is just summarizing ideas, right? Um, and then uh, the atom, uh, what do we have here? The atom, um, oh yeah, yeah, the atom means un indivisible. Um, so it tur turns out they're actually made up of even more fundamental particles. So truly, uh, it turns out the atom isn't actually the smallest bit of a of matter. It's actually made up of even smaller things. So there's the smaller things, for example, in the nucleus, the neutrons and the protons. Um, and then even more than that, of course, is that the protons and neutrons are made up of things. So I'm going to stay on this page a little bit longer for us. Um, this is the one about quarks specifically. Right. So it's, it was discovered long, you know, fair bit after the, the people discovered there was an atom. And then finally, people peered a little deeper and saw neutrons and protons. Physicists peered even deeper into the universe uh, reality and found that protons and neutrons are made up of quarks. Um, so. Uh, what do we have here? There's different types of quarks. There's up and down quarks. Uh, so this is actually a, a proton here. So let's just circle one proton is two up quarks and a down quark. Um, so our quarks, finally a fundamental particle. Physicists think they are, but it's possible we might end up finding out uh, that they're made up of things, the quarks themselves. Um, the one thing that we definitely already, uh, physicists definitely already think of is uh, string theory. And um, they think that, for example, a, um, a down quark, right? So a, a down quark. Um, equals certain something and then an up quark equals and the certain something is that string theory is uh, that all particles are made up of um, bits of strings of space time so all particles I don't want to do a full string theory lesson here but all particles are made uh, uh, made of um, bits or small strings of space-time. And you've heard of space-time before in grade 11 where we talked about uh, Einstein's general theory of relativity for gravity, um, that the universe is made up of space-time and blah, blah, blah. But think of space and time combined as a, as a quantity or as a, as, a, as, a, as a substance almost, right? Um, and so what it is, is they actually take advantage of the idea that space time, a little string of space time could be vibrating like this, or it could be vibrating 
like back and forth, right? Like think of your um, your your uh, motion, your unit from grade 11, where we talked about sound waves and so on. So picture like a vibration like that, or picture a vibration, a simpler vibration like this, or picture a crazy vibration, right? All those things correspond to different particles. Um, so they think. So they think like a down quark might be this one, and an up quark might be this one, right? And so the idea here is each one of these has a specific energy. So this is like energy number one, and this is energy number two, corresponding to all these different vibration patterns. So obviously if you're vibrating a spring at different patterns, there's different energies that correspond to that. And so the link here is you've heard of, this will come up again in this lesson, but you've heard of E equals MC squared. So that's Einstein's famous equation that gives the equivalence between uh, energy and mass. Um, remember previously I talked about, uh, we've seen that uh, the mass of an electron is 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms, um, but it's also 0.511 mega electron volts. So for, uh, for, a, um, for an electron, you got the energy equivalent of 9.11 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31. 9.11, oops, I'm combining my thoughts with my writing here. 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms. And so, you know, the C squared business is that conversion between this energy unit. Now you'd have to make sure to work in SI units here, mega electron volts, you'd have to like multiply that out and you have the charge of the electron you've got the mega factor and so on but basically um this this converts uh kilograms to um, joules okay so this is a certain number of joules mega electron volts is actually a certain number of joules and the conversion factor involves the speed of light squared um, but anyways so these energies correspond to different masses is what i'm trying to get at okay so this equals mass number one this equals mass number two. And so just basically a bunch of different vibration patterns of little pieces of strings people are working on to see if they can get equations that give you the properties of all these particles. And from there it goes on and on to figure out how they how the forces work and so on. That's what string theory is. Okay, so we've heard of string theory probably. That's what it is. People trying to figure out equations uh, based on the vibration patterns of uh, things in order to get an equivalence between that particle and the mass and all the different properties. Okay, this is kind of inspired by over and over again, we've found cases where it's like you find equations that weren't really to do with what you're talking about, but it applies. So uh, Einstein did it with, uh, with general relativity. So he found equations for big curved surfaces and realized like, Ooh, look at these, these work perfect for gravity. Um, you know, the, the uh, electromagnetic equations ended up working for um, another branch of quantum mechanics. And then and they just basically find examples where the equations from other things apply. And then it sort of uh, implies other uh, relationships between these ideas. Anyways, so fundamentally, we could be talking about everything's really just pieces of space time strings vibrating with specific patterns and specific energies, therefore specific masses, and therefore specific everything properties and so on. Questions so far? So trying to peer deep into the universe to see what things are made up of here. So we're, we kind of went deeper than we're actually going to be talking most of this lesson. Went down to the fact that they're really even just maybe strings, right? So let's go back up to the, uh, that's just the atom model. We don't need that. Um, so scale of the atom, or you know, like we're looking at the atom down to pro, um, down to the nucleus, down to individual protons, down to in individual quarks. Notice we're dividing by like ten thousand, and then dividing by ten thousand again, and then dividing by a hundred thousand. Like we're talking really, really small scale stuff. Okay. So um, yeah, we're constantly looking for new particles, trying to look to see if if you know a quark is really on its own as as a fundamental bit, um, or whether it's made up of other stuff. Right, that's what this slide is about, right? Um, so that this this web of um, fundamental particles, um, the quote that's kind of funny here is um, the uh, Leon Letterman, future, he ended up getting the Nobel Prize. Um, anyways, he, he quoted, his, uh, he said, um, 
when he's looking at all the different names, he's like, ah, man, if I could remember all the names of these particles, I would have been a botanist. I would have been a biologist if I could memorize a bunch of names of, of, of things. Um, that's supposed to be funny, but sometimes biology people get offended. But some branches of science have more memorization than others, right? Of, of bits and pieces, like memorizing all the parts of a flower, for example, um, or all the names of different birds and so on. Anyways, um, yeah, so we're looking for what all the particles are. So as we saw in that flow chart, um, the standard model explains the universe, right? Based on there being like six quarks and six leptons and bosons, the force carrier particles and so on. And basically you take all those uh, bits and you mix them together in the right way and you get, you get your, your universe. Right, reality stew, they call it. Um, it's it's your universe. It all every, all the universe is made up of all of these these ingredients. Is the idea of what I'm trying to get across. So the quarks and and leptons um, are your main your main show, right? When you look out and see things in the universe, or you see a mountain, or you see a molecule of water, we're talking about you know quarks that make up the baryons and and the leptons involved too, right? So quarks and leptons. I should maybe add it's baryons as well, right? Quarks, which make up baryons. And fermions actually is the other word too, but so let's use fermions, that's the, that's the highest category one. Right, so um, quarks, which make up the fermions and the leptons. Um, so that's the idea of what we're looking at, right? Um, I wanna point out that there's also something called antimatter. So for every type of matter particle we're listing, there's also a corresponding antimatter particle. Um, so for example, the electron you're familiar with, um, there's also an antiparticle called an anti-electron or some, sometimes it's called a positron. Most often it's called a positron. Um, it's just an opposite. It's just an antiparticle to it. And so they, they look and they behave a lot like their corresponding matter particles, um, but they have opposite charges and opposite other, other physical properties as well. Um, so the positron is, is uh, what do we have here? A proton is electrically positive, or an antiproton would be electrically negative. And obviously an anti-electron is positive instead of negative and so on, right? Um, gravity affects matter and antimatter the same way though, because gravity is not a charge property. Um, so anyways, uh, if we had something you need to know is that uh, or as a part of this, just a piece of reality or like what happens is if you have a, an antimatter particle here and a, and a particle, they come together, they actually annihilate and produce energy. Um, so that's kind of weird. They, I think it says somewhere in a slide along here somewhere, but they, they think of um, mathematically antiparticles um, are, are the same as regular particles, but moving, get this, backwards in time. So antiparticles, another way to look at it mathematically is they're the same as the particle. So the regular particle. Um, but move backwards in time. So yeah. So you know when you're solving like a quadratic formula, do you get like a plus or minus answer for time in in, in uh, uniform acceleration questions we're going to be doing again soon? Um, and we always say like, well, obviously the negative time doesn't mean anything, right? Um, they kind of did that in, in quantum in this stuff for a while too, and then they realized, wait a minute, that backwards in time has a has an interpretation. So the the antiparticle is it, they they end up with that kind of same answer. Um, where they have a positive and negative, and for, for decades they ignored the negative, and then they finally realized, like, wait a minute, that could mean that it's moving backwards in time, and they and it actually led to another interpretation of quantum mechanics. More to come later on that one in the course, not today. Um, but yeah, so slow down. What we're talking about here, we're talking about antimatter and pure energy, and and so on. Antimatter is strange, but you know, it's it's just what it is. You've got particles as a bubble chamber, and so you've got a charged particle coming along. So this is actually good for us um, that we talked about the electromagnetic unit because you can picture how a, a magnetic field would make a charged particle accelerate to the to the right or to the left depending on whether it's positive or negative charge. Um, so this is how they discover particles. They look for tracks of particles and then they analyze what the charge must have been and the mass must have been and the energy must have been and so on. This is what they do all day long. If they're if, a, if you're looking at a particle physicist. 
they're analyzing tracks of particles because you can't hold them in your hand and put them on a scale and weigh them, but you can track their behavior and uh, figure out what must have been um, must have been true. Um, so what we have here is a, basically a, a regular particle and an antiparticle curling in opposite directions in purple there because they have opposite charges. So what else do I want to see for this one? There's that backwards in time thing I said I was gonna, I knew it was in there somewhere, but yeah. So moving on. Um, so quarks, finally a little bit more detail on those. Um, there's up quarks and down quarks, right? But then there's also different, um, uh, they call them flavors, but um, there's different versions of quarks. And so the, think of like, you're familiar with the idea of, of charge being positive or negative. And that's just to be able to talk about, you know, attractions and repulsions. Um, this is the same as that. Char positive and negative, you feel like it means something in terms of charge, but it's just names. And so they needed names to describe properties of quarks. Turns out, based on the behaviors, they need three names. Uh, so they call them the up is the like a positive negative. And then they call that a charmed and a strange, like a positive and negative as well. Depend, you know, whatever properties you're talking about, there's two versions of it. And then there's also a top and a bottom. So it's like if a charge could do three different things instead of just attracting and repelling, it could do another behavior and then yet another behavior as well. You'd have to say positive and negative, plus also like, I don't know, blue and green and plus also yes and no or something. You know, you have to have just names. The names they chose for quarks were up, down, charged, strange and charm, sorry, and uh, top and bottom. So again, that's just to be able to talk about um, behaviors, right? So if you have like, if, if this was the same as charge, if you have an up quark and an up quark, then they're going to repel each other. And if you have an up quark and a down quark, then they're going to attract each other if, if you're talking about a charge equivalent, right? Um, Uh, particle idea for a good physicist idea of a good pun. I'm not sure what that's going to be here. I forget. Let's go view. Read with. Um, decide how much I want to emphasize this stuff. I think their names. This is what I was talking about. How there's different flavors and different types in order to describe different properties. So it's not not really fun. That I don't need to spend much time on this. Um, you know, it just has history about when the bottom quark was discovered and the top quark was discovered and so on. But um, why is this all blurry? Weird. Page was blurry, now it's not. Um, anyways, basically just different names to help keep track of, of what happens, as I, as I alluded to on the other page. Same as having charge being positive or negative. So now we know a little bit more about quarks. Go back to this little uh, thing all the time here. Keep track of what page I'm on first. I've already lost it. Oh well. Um, so we we know that baryons and hadrons and mesons are made up of quarks. So here we go. Baryons are made up of three types of quarks, or three quarks, I should say, right? Um, so for example, protons are two up quarks and a down quark, like I said. Neutrons are an up and two downs. Mesons are only uh, they uh, no, they can't contain a quark and an anti-quark. Sorry, I was saying the two quarks, which is sort of true, but it's actually a quark and an anti-quark. Um, those are mesons. So there's pi mesons and there's antiparticle pi mesons and, and so on. So the weird thing about hadrons is, uh, what did they say? Only a very, very small part of the mass of a hadron is due to the quarks in it. Um, and that's when we talk about the the Higgs field later on. Um, so we'll get there. Uh, page am I on? Looking for the page that has it highlighted. Screen here. There's a couple pages. There we go. Um, so leptons are a whole different breed of things, right? They appear as they appear to be point charges um, without any internal structure. Um, muons and tau particles included. Um, and, the, and the neutrinos that correspond. Um, they have these different types. And so there's the electron. They, they try to show it in terms of um, in terms of uh, animals to help you visualize like things. So electron has fairly small mass. Tau particle is quite a bit heavier than electron. 
So when I was just putting this lesson together, I said here, you know, I typed in, you know, you needed a, they needed a really power, a more powerful particle accelerator to discover or, or to um, sort of prove the existence of this tau particle. And so they're looking for a specific track in a bubble chamber in order to say, yeah, there it is. It has the right mass that we predicted. It has the charge we predicted. It has the information, right? And so I thought, hey, I'll just Google this to see, um, you know, who discovered the tau particle. And I got came up with a hit. It was like Martin Pearl, you know, at the Stanford Linear Accelerator in like 19 in the 1970s. So I was in, I typed here just in general saying like you would have needed a particle accelerator to get lots of energy in order to have that energy be able to actually produce uh, convert really to be the mass of the particle you're trying to confirm exists. Okay, so a big particle accelerator slams like two protons together maybe, and if the energy that, it, that you came in with excess energy equal to the energy that this mass of this particle is equivalent to, that particle actually gets produced in that interaction. So when you go back to these bubble chambers here, you know, there's, there's a particle that was produced here in this interaction when two things slam together. Weird, wild stuff, but it's reality. Um, lepton decays. So something to know about is that these leptons can can change into other particles on their own. So you got a, a muon particle and it's decaying to be an anti-electron and some neutrinos. You know, that's just something that happens. Um, so it says here when leptons decay, it becomes anti-quarks and anti neutrinos and so on, right? But um, something that's true is that the 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 numbers and the families have to remain constant. Um, like we we're talking about, remember I said there's different flavors and charges and colors and so on. Um, I'm not asking you to memorize this. I'm just basically showing you the idea of it. But there's there's numbers, there's electron numbers, there's muon numbers, and there's tau numbers. It's kind of like having a, a charge and a mass and so on, right? It's values for different properties. Um, the the equation has to be true in, in the end still. So what I mean by that is like if a muon decays to become these three particles, if the electron number was zero to start with, it has to be zero in the end. And what you notice here is that electron number would still be zero. The muon number starts out as a one and the muon number to, um, to do with these particles is still there. So it's kind of like conservation of energy almost. Right, the, the the electron number, muon number, tau number you started with, it has to be the same as what you end up with. And so physicists can predict what will happen based on the idea of conservation of, of these numbers. And again, it's just to help you answer those questions a little bit, at least about, about how the heck do they know this, right? And so can a tau particle decay to become these things? And just in general here, the idea is, um, to say, to say, yeah, they can because the numbers would be conserved and I'm not asking you to analyze it. Uh, can a tau particle become a muon and a tau neutrino? The answer is no, because you know if you analyzed it out, the muon number wouldn't be conserved um, and so on for each one of these ones, okay? So just that's the idea of it, just in general, just to help you picture what particle physicists can do. Okay, they can actually predict what can or can't happen and then they test it and they're right like all the time it's, it works really well um neutrinos um you've heard a little bit about them in the past but they're a type of lepton they have you know property where they can go through mass really really easily um and what do they show here neutrinos are produced in a variety of interactions so they're going to show here uh radioactive nucleus um and then it uh, it's decaying so you you're hearing about this in chemistry actually right now. But you have a neutron and it is decaying to be a proton and an electron um, and energy released and so on. Um, so in the end we get this neutrino that comes off as a part of this and uh, that's what you're talking about with nuclear reactions. But vague overview of ideas of things is all we're doing right now. So protons are made of, if you've been following along, they're made up of quarks, two up quarks and a down quark. Electrons are just electrons. They're, they're leptons, they're just what they are. Uh, baryons, they're three quarks. Mesons, remember they're a quark and an anti-quark. You know, like it's just starting to try and put some of this together here, but um, 
bear. Oh, this is a bad joke here. Not not very funny. But they're saying, what what about barons? I don't know, barons, like as in like people in England, right? So they're made up of quarks, right? Remember I said that all all stuff around us is made up of quarks and, and basically Barons in England are made up of quarks. It's supposed to be funny. Uh, so those four uh, fundamental forces and those interactions, we talked about how there's the graviton and there's the photon and there's the gluons and there's the you know the the bosons, the W and the Z and so on. Um, those interactions, right, um, cause those those forces. So I just want basically. I wanted to give you an idea of what those particles are, and then we can think about interactions between those particles. Um, so with the strong force, you're talking about like up quarks and down quarks and so on, like the, those those uh, particles, and then they're exchanging uh, gluons, you know. Anyways, force and interaction mean the same thing, basically, if you're wondering. Mm. So in here, when we have two Norths repelling each other, they're actually like bouncing photons off each other to, to create a repulsion, right? So it's actually, um, there's actually particles passing, exchange particles passing between these two objects. Um, if you picture, um, if you picture people like they show here, I think they have, um, what do they have here? One person moves their arm and is pushed backwards a moment later driven backwards. Oh yeah. So picture this in, in on, on a frozen slippery rink and, and you th if you threw like a heavy ball at the other person, you're going to get pushed back that way. And when they catch it, they're going to get pushed that, push back that way. And so this is just a, a, a rudimentary kind of equivalent idea that, you know, an, an interaction between them without touching, you're throwing a particle back and forth can make repulsion happen. That is what the idea of that one is. Um, so these exchange particles we've been talking about. Um, Oh yeah, this is these exchange particles we're talking about make forces happen is all we're saying. This is the basketball um, analogy that I just talked about. We don't have to spend time thinking about that. We throw a ball between heavy enough ball between on a slippery surface. You're both going to be repelled backwards, right? I thought the fun the warning was funny down here though. It says warning: if you are absorbing or producing a force carrier particle, you better be attracted um, by the by the force that's carried or repelled. Um, and it says violators will be prosecuted for undermining reality. In other words, the reality of the world around us of attractions and repulsions to do with magnetism and electric force and so on that we've been talking about are actually to do with these exchange particles. So that's that's just what's really going on. Um, so I really should come with that warning label maybe so no one undermines reality. So we know with electromagnetism, we've got the photon bouncing back and forth between these things and that the intention of these slides just whipping through here is just to help reinforce the ideas right you, you know for sure these things attract right a positive and negative attract but they are exchanging photons to make that happen and here they're going to repel and they're exchanging photons to make that happen it's just the way they exchange and the way things happen are are different right to make it attraction or repulsion um, but it's actually photons being exchanged weird wild stuff um the electromagnetic force we know we're talking about the the tau particle or the um W and Z bosons and so on. What are they showing here exactly? Oh, the proton attracting an electron and so on. Um, I don't. That's more chemistry. We don't need to do that as much, maybe. But we do. We're talking about the meaning of life here, though. All structures in the world exist simply because protons have opposite charges. Yeah, like basically they're saying like the structure of the universe exists because of these these things that we understand, right? So all chemistry that you've ever talked about is to do with these forces, fundamental forces we're talking about. So the nucleus question, um, I don't know, you, I know you guys, a lot of you guys have chemistry. Did anybody ask uh, Mr. Hartley uh, how the nucleus doesn't repel apart? I, I kind of wish more students would ask that, especially since I've talked about it with you guys. But because um, in chemistry, you talk about the electrons attracting to the protons and so on. You got this model, but chemists avoid this question like the plague. So I'd be curious what he'd, what he'd say if you asked. Um, so at some point, someone, please ask him. To say, hey, I have some thinking about something, Mr. Hurley. Uh, electrons attract to the nucleus because of opposite charges. How come the, you know, the positives don't repel apart? 
um, and, and it's, it's, yeah, this slide is pointing out here. It's not gravity is not nearly strong enough. Instead, it's the um, attraction force or the uh, attraction force to do the strong nuclear force, right? I think maybe the next one talks about that, yeah. So the strong nuclear force is what glues these things together. So the strong force, <laughs> remember we talked about names for categories of things. Well, it turns out we need three types of things for quarks as well, just like with um, with the other ones. The um, uh, this is for they call this quantum chromodynamics. So this is due with the strong force in particular. Okay, so the quarks themselves have different types up, down, strange charms, and so on. But then to do with the strong force, which is called quantum chromodynamics, I should add that in. Chromo, chromo, chromo. Um, Chromatic means like color, right? So uh, quantum um, chromodynamics um, is the, the math that uh, predicts, explains, whatever, that the math of That's the one where they looked at the electrodynamic stuff. They looked at the Maxwell's equations for the uh, electromagnetism, and uh, it, it worked pretty darn well for um, for the math for this uh, quantum force inside of the nucleus. Anyways, so red, green, and blue, and then you had red, and you had anti-red, and you had green, and anti -red. So this works beautifully with the color analogy because of the, the complementary colors, right? The, the opposite colors to do with primary and secondary colors. Anyways, so that the math to do with that has to do, there's numbers to do with those things. Um, so quarks carry this color to do with them, right? And then that's to do the analysis of the colors and so on leads to the the correct predictions to do with what kind of forces um, and what things happen with with these particles. And again, it's just an overview of the ideas. So that you, when you see this later, you're gonna be like, oh, I remember hearing about yeah, there's different colors. And then if you had a red quark and a green quark, maybe they're maybe they have a certain interaction versus versus others other color combinations. Um, so there's a weird thing where they, they call it quantum uh, confinement or quark confinement, um, where you can't have quarks like on their own. Um, they can't be found individually. Um, they're always in groups of three or, or an up quark and a down, or an up quark and a, sorry, a, a quark and an anti-quark. Um, so the mesons are the quark anti-quarks and then you have three quarks together and so on. But you can't, no one's ever found like a, a, a two quark combo or a four quark combo. Um, they they don't have that, um, and so it's basically yeah like that would that would be like what they call a color neutral state because you'd have a picture having um, a, a red and a green and then you're like oh that would combine to be yellow and it's color neutral or whatever you want to call it right um, so that it's just not found uh, to be true something interesting about the world around us that you have to have either three or a, or a cork and any cork weird stuff but observation you know observations and then they make theories to do with it and they can predict new things and if, if the new predictions are, are true on a reliable basis then you feel pretty good about your theory right so this is remember we talked about the, the electron numbers being conserved same thing here color charge is always conserved so basically it comes down to can blank happen well if, well, that's a lot of P's, can blank happen? The answer is uh, if the color numbers, right? Numbers are conserved. Then yes. Same as before with the electron numbers and the muon numbers and so on. Um, so strong force, that's to do with holding the nucleus together, we talked about. Um, which we've talked about that before, but yeah, the detail you may, I think I've mentioned it before, but the strong force, um, we know it holds the nucleus together and it has a neat kind of, uh, it it'll, should make sense in the long run here, like they, they, it has a what they call asymptotic freedom. So as the distance is increased from like almost nothing, um, the, the force actually gets stronger. The strong force gets stronger the further you go away, whereas the other forces we looked at, of course, get, um, they taper off with distance, you know, distance squared specifically. Um, so they actually get stronger until a maximum distance is reached and then the force drops to nothing. So it's stronger and stronger force. Uh, if you're looking at a force 
and distance away, you know, diagram, the force gets stronger and stronger and stronger, um, and then goes to nothing, to zero. Um, and I, I just do one time point out, it'd be kind of like an elastic band. You know, it's like you're stretching elastic band, you get more and more force, and then if the elastic band breaks, all of a sudden there's no uh, force. And that force is around, uh, what is it, 14 femtometers. Um, so that's like, you know, 1.4 times 10 to the negative 14. And uh, that's the F. Um, and that is not coincidentally um, the, about the diameter, the average diameter of a, of a nucleus. So basically, nucleuses are held together, right? Nuclei are held together by the strong force. Any protons or neutrons that are outside of that diameter just don't have any force of attraction to them. So there's a, a bit of a link to the reality of the world around us in the chemistry class as well because of this strong force property. So the weak interactions, like I'll just start jumping over this, but same idea, we've got these different types of particles and we've got the, the, that exchange between them. And if the numbers are conserved from one side of an interaction to another, then that, that interaction can happen. Just ideas here, right? Um, so the this uh, electroweak Electroweak theory. Um, people managed to put together a combined theory uh, for electromagnetism and the weak nuclear in, uh, reaction. Um, and so that is the electroweak theory, if you study that ever, um, and which is a pretty awesome step toward that grand unified theory I was talking about, right? That theory of everything where we want to combine all four forces. And so they managed to combine electric, electric and magnetism originally when really Orsted discovered it and realized, oh, they're, they're kind of part and, part and parcel, right? Um, then, since then, uh, the weak nuclear and the electromagnetic was just um, combined into electroweak, um, which is, like I said, a huge step. If they can manage to lump gravity into that and, and that too, then you've got a theory that describes everything. Uh, yeah. So the gravity one, though, <laughs> is the one that's not fitting in at all, right? This uh, graviton hasn't been found. They're, 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 they're still actually quite confused by gravity and how it fits into the, the picture. Um, we're trying to talk about gravity on a super small scale. Einstein described gravity on a large scale. That's what general relativity is. But this is to try and have an equation for gravity on a small scale. And they, the two, the two uh, realms are incompatible with one another at this point, unfortunately. Uh, so that interaction summary, I mean, obviously we talked about the weak force and the, the exchange particles, the electromagnetic and the exchange particles and so on. That's this is a review, we've done that already. So fundamental force involved, well, this is just, yeah, this is this goes back to grade 11 really, but you know, friction is really the electromagnetic interactions, right? Nuclear bonding is a strong force, of course. What force attracts planets together and stars together? Obviously gravity. Um, so this is the big deal. But what interactions act on neutrinos? Neutrinos are to do with weak and gravity, but obviously most. Um, yeah, which interaction act as heavy carriers? I don't even I don't remember what that means to be honest. Which interactions act on the protons and you be everything because that that's up to your mass. Whatever. Force carriers cannot be isolated. Oh yeah, because the gluons and quarks. So I'm, I'm not expecting you to be like the resident expert on this at this point um, by any means, um, but uh, just overall idea, right? So um, quantum mechanics has to do with the fact that everything can be, um, everything in nature is actually in, in smallest bite-sized pieces, basically, even energy and mass and all this stuff can only be down into certain small pieces, kind of like we discovered with charge, right? You can't have any old charge you want. It has to be, um, you know, the single charge of an electron or multiples of it. Um, so with uh, quarks, they actually have a third charge, but they're always lumped together in threes. So we end up with, you know, the, the whole numbers of charge. Um, there's there's color charge. There's flavor numbers. There's spin. There's all these different numbers that piece together into um, the standard model. So. Yeah, uh, you've heard of this in chemistry, that two particles can't be in the same place at the same time. Um, 
this is an animation to do with the, that, I guess. I don't know. Um, so with with they can't they can't, but bosons can, I guess. They um, bosons can be in the same spot. So that's animation showing bo bosons all lumping into the same spot and forming like a uh, once you get three of them, you know, you'd have a quark. You'd have a, a proton, for example. You got three quarks coming in there. So it's interesting the con um, contradiction between the other the other things we've seen that that you can two electrons can't be in the same spot. That's the Pauli exclusion principle, um, but um, but they can bosons can do that. Let's review. We've already seen that page. Uh, going back to those questions, basically saying like, hey, we've kind of gone through those, we've answered those. What I was thinking, I guess, right? So this is a this is a, a poster that uh, you know describes all of the things we've talked about, you know, all of those, all the, the big, big picture of the, the universe and what it is and all the different particles that make everything up. Um, so anyways, so the testing of this theory, of course, you perform experiments and see if things work, you, know, you smash particles together with lots of energy. Um, and then that energy, um, this is to do with how you accelerate a particle, but not it's just basically think of it as we've talked about. They, they're showing us like the electron rides on this like mag electromagnetic wave and gets accelerated. It gives you a little bit of an idea of that, but that's not really necessary since we're just talking about the force exists because it's exchanging particles. End of story. But they're helping visualize with this idea of a wave pushing it. But what I wanted to mention here was that just to have a, an official slide to do with the idea of like smashing things together and seeing what happens. So you have two particles smashing together with lots of energy, then the energy can actually produce particles because energy equals mass times speed light squared, right? And so they can actually smash particles together and specifically so they have a certain energy that may, that'll help make sure that a certain particle is produced because there's a certain particle that corresponds to that amount of energy. That's how simple it is if you think of it that way, right? You want to make a tau particle and smash two protons together with the amount of energy they have equal to the energy equivalent to a tau particle. And you get to see a tau particle. So that's why you need bigger and bigger particle accelerators to make heavier and heavier mass particles, right? You need more energy to make the bigger mass stuff. And that's what the Large Hadron Collider was about uh, that came online five years ago or so. They made this large, large Hadron Collider to be able to make even heavier particles. So that's the e equals mc squared thing that I've talked about already. So that energy mass conversion. This is a, if you're curious, you know, looking for details about that, but you know, the, that what I've said applies here. The excess energy, you know, dictates what kind of particle gets created. And this is the the event, you know, in a bubble chamber they call it, or where you're detecting the tracks of the different particles. You got a particle smashing in from this way, and a particle smashing in from that way, and then a bunch of particles were created, and you look at all the traces and you figure out what what was made and what happened. So that's what the we're just talking about the detectors we use, like a bubble chamber uses zinc sulfide, and it, it produces little bubbles as it goes through, but not something you need to know details of, uh, obviously. Um, yeah, I don't know, I might skip this part. The Higgs boson. Um, the Higgs boson is a is a recent thing that they they're looking for, um, and uh, it has to do with the the mass, how, how particles get their mass, um, and uh, <sighs> no, I'm not going to watch that right now. Um, so the Higgs Higgs boson. Um, there was um, a theorist, Peter Higgs, um, and he was the leader, I guess, of these guys more so. But the, it's named after him. But basically, they they would they they theorize why something has why particles have mass, and they they get it from this so-called Higgs field. And uh, so the Higgs field would have a Higgs boson. They would go along. Remember the bosons are those those uh, exchange particles. Um, so just going to vaguely, vaguely give you an idea of, of what we have here. There's that large hadron collider to try and to try and confirm the existence of the uh, of the Higgs boson. Um, so it's lots of energy with a huge accelerator to be able to get enough energy. Uh, this is a picture from the room. Uh, all the scientists super happy. Um, definitely need more women in that picture. There's one, but uh, it's, a, it's a, it is a male-dominated field at this point. But man, 
that's going to change over time for sure. Um, anyways, so that this is what them, you know, seeing uh, the res result when they're, you know, giving their results of, of you know, confirming the Higgs boson. Um, so what was it, July 4th, 2012? I said like five years ago, now it's more like eight or nine, I guess, right? But they were presenting the results about the Higgs boson and here's the pictures that they, you know, that they generated to sort of indicate the idea of uh, the results that they, they got. So they're at the point where they're like a five, you know, they're a five sigma result. Sigma result. You'll hear that term in, in science, um, which means it's a one chance in a million that, that this was a by accident um, result. So they're pretty confident. Um, so here's your, your, here, here's your uh, particle equivalents to do with all these different Higgs particles and how they interact. Again, not looking for details here, just vaguely talking about the idea of it, right? Um, so the idea of this Higgs field, they have these cartoons here where it was like, if, if something doesn't have much mass, they're able to just walk through this room easily and they, they don't interact with many people. So if someone that no one knows walks through the room, then they're, they're not interacting with the Higgs field. They don't have much mass. So that might be like a neutrino. And then they talk about if some, some, if someone like if Albert Einstein walked in the room, all these scientists would be like, oh my God, I got to talk to Einstein, right? So Einstein would have a hard time to get through the room because he'd have a whole bunch of people talking to him. And so Einstein would represent a particle that has lots of mass because it's interacting with the Higgs field a lot. And so the Higgs field and the Higgs boson, it's the interactions and so on. That's why those were, that's why they were, um, uh, that's why they're considered to be part of the situation as well, but where they're not really fitting in this one, is there? The Large Hadron, I don't know, that fit that in that category, I guess. Um, so that's just that same diagram basically describing that stuff. So you have these different particles to do with each of the forces, right? You've got your, um, and different characteristics too, like the strong force, you know, like what's its range? There's that 10 to the negative number, right? 10 to the negative 14 or 15 for the size of the nucleus. And the electromagnetism, you know, it's infinite and gravity too is infinite, right? Um, it tapers off to zero eventually, but technically goes to infinity, zero at infinity. Um, so this is just the details, right? So this is not a memorization thing. It's just a, a page to say, oh, I, I get it. They're talking about the strength. So if, if strong force is one, electro electromagnetic um, is one one thirty seventh of that, uh, weak is one one millionth of that, and gravity is one I don't know what to call it of that, right? It's ten to the negative nine in compare ten to the negative thirty nine. Sorry, comparison is strength. So when I say gravity is weak, it's weak by far, like times you know, divide by a, a number with, with 39 zeros after it in comparison to the force that holds nuclei together. Uh, ridiculous, craziness, difference in strength. Um, it was asked, I showed a little bit of this stuff before, but this is a, a neutron and a proton interacting. Um, and there's, you know, the, the pi meson exchange between, there's your, part, int, uh, your, um, your uh, action at a distance exchange particle going on. So they show it like this, a neutron becomes a proton, and a proton becomes a neutron when they're interacting, weird stuff, but um, with an anti-meson exchanging between them. Um, so it's it's a way of showing the interactions. Um, the other trick one here, we're gonna have, oh, this is our this is our normal electromagnetic stuff, right? KQQ bar squared for force, the, the motor of principal force, you know, all that stuff, all it is what we've talked about. Um, so then what they're what they're basically saying is that um, the interactions we're talking about to do with, you know, electrons and the photon being uh, exchanged leads to these results on a, on a large scale. Where is it? Leads to these results on a large scale that we're used to talking about. But it's actually because of photons exchanging. Okay. So just basically there's more to it than, uh, than you, you think. So there's the W particles and Z particles, you know, for for the weak force and so on. Just again, just the idea of it. So that's about it for that part. So clearly, there's lots of detail known about the three uh, three of the four forces. So there's there's more pages here. We got to add some pages to this, right? So this is going to be like your gravity work in the future. Gravity work in the future. Future. Whatever. Right? We 
things. Those are the next pages, hopefully. That'd be cool. So we got all sorts of detail about three of the four courses, but not the other ones. Um, I put on there just to read and I put page numbers, but you know what? Uh, let me just take a look and see if I still want to suggest those. They're probably fairly straightforward, but I just want to remind myself what level of complexity they were talking about here. Three, four, and five. I don't think that would add much to your uh, to your life, to be honest. Um, so, you know, you're having trouble sleeping on a, on a Wednesday night or something at some point. <clears throat> you can read through uh, the 727 to 732, but certainly not uh, not something that I'm going to be testing. Alrighty, so that was your documentary channel version of uh, basically trying to tie together the things we've talked about so far. Right, electromagnetic and, and so on, and relating it to all other things we've talked about as well. Whew. Any questions about that? That was number 27. Not specifically, it's just a lot <laughs> to think yeah. about. It's weird, wild stuff. And so basically, it's okay for your brain to be kind of like, wait, what? Um, but hopefully, the idea of it is like, you have some information there that your brain's going to sort of start to try and categorize and understand and fit together. And when you learn specifics later on, one of the flaws of, of physics teaching um, in university, for me at least anyways, was that I felt like there wasn't a, a lot of focus on big ideas. It was always just like the nitty gritty of the calculations all the time. And it was hard to, hard to get an overall view of what the heck you're even talking about a lot of times. Um, so that, you know, you obviously end up with a better understanding of things if you have the big picture in mind as you're as you're doing a bunch of calculations. So that's my hope on that one anyways. Um, so that brings us to um, the next unit. Um, the ideas of that stuff are just sort of, yeah, like I said, not adding a lot of work to your plate right now, just basically getting you thinking about some of the things. So I wonder if maybe I should start this next one, but only do part of it and finish it tomorrow because I was concerned I wouldn't be able to finish that this today anyway. So I'll get you, I'm just gonna very briefly introduce the, the idea of this uh, uniform acceleration stuff and remind you of things that we did in a lot of detail in grade 11. So my intention is not to spend a lot of grade 12 time on uniform acceleration, um, but it'll come up in um, other types. And so I just wanna do this part for now, um, which is just your uniform acceleration basics and, and so on, and give you a chance to review some of that stuff. And then we'll look at the, the new types tomorrow, catch up questions and meet in the middle questions and so on, where there's, you know, if you, it, the first time you see it, it's going to involve more problem solving, of course, and then each, each time you do another question, you, more pra you, know, you get more practice and it becomes simpler. But the uniform acceleration basics, for sure, to start out with, um, that's the homework question to do with a catch-up question, so you're not doing that one yet. Um, but yeah, so just to remind you of the basics of this. You know, you, you have these uniform acceleration equations, which we gained a big understanding of in grade 11 through the graphing technique and so on. And eventually we got to the point where we're like, okay, I kind of get it. I can just use these equations. So the main goal is circle, you know, so if they gave you V1 and they gave you V2 and they're asking for the acceleration and they gave you the displacement or something you know you're like oh check it out i can use this equation right that's the, the goal of that so you're going to see in the homework solutions that i'm posting i actually print out uh where is it here this page i actually print out for myself of this page right and then i just have them there each time i want to use them um in grade 11 i think I think you guys had a, a printout with you know a big one on the top and the bottom you just sort of kept erasing and using or whatever um but uh i'll I may, i'll post that file as well as a pdf if you want to just print that out each time you want to do a question like this to make your life easy however you want to go about it um but you know that's that's the idea of what we're doing here so if you have a um you put in numbers and solve for the missing variable of course uh oh this is a yeah so if you had a car, a question about a car traveling, you know, it travels 30 meters while traveling a certain amount of time and so on. Um, just like you've seen in other classes, you know, the grasp method where you're like, write down your given and you're required.
required and so on. I always just do given, but the rest of it follows suit. Um, but you plug in, you pick the equation based on the uniform acceleration equation selection matrix sheet, this thing. Right there, my computer's slow right now. Um, and you just plug numbers in itself, right? Um, option number two, um, you'll see in textbooks where they, they actually solve for the variable you're looking for and then put numbers in. Not my preference, but doesn't hurt. It still still works. But basically, um, in this case here, let's just copy this sucker in here. And obviously the equation we would select based on what we're given and so on is pretty easy to do. So let's just look and see the like US displacement. This might be the same as what I just served on the other page, but we'll see. Oh, time, no, it's different. And the final velocity, so V final or V2, like that. And we want to know the acceleration. So we can tell we're going to pick this equation. Okay. So V final times time, take away the, you know, one half acceleration delta C squared stuff. Okay. So then you just plug numbers in and solve. So that's basically what I want you to spend a little bit of time doing, just reminding yourself of that process being not hard. Um, so, you know, this version, the page here, shows the case where you, know, you pick the equation and you plug in numbers or you pick the equation and you start solving for the variable you want and so just for the purpose of you know having you have something you can work from and 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 uh, you know confirm your answers and so on um you can plug numbers in and just algebraically solve for acceleration or you could solve for acceleration first which is this formula right here right or circling with the mouse and then just plug numbers in. I don't I have too many people that like that, but just plug numbers in and solve, I think it's the easiest. Um, the round, oh yeah, this is a little bit about an advanced rounding rule, but I'm remembering to mention this here. Um, this this number comes up as six uh, 2.625, okay? First of all, I'm gonna add to this that you're gonna keep all decimals if you're doing calcul further calculations, use, use as many numbers as your calculator will carry for you, right? Um, or at least use a bunch. But when you're rounding an answer um, and you want to you know, keep you know, a certain number of significant digits here, um, 6.2.625, the rounding rule for that is you're going to round that to a two. You're going to round so that it's even. Okay, So you always round so that it's an even number if you have a five that you're rounding out. Um, and that's so that you don't round up more times than you round down. Okay. Um, so if you had, uh, oh, that's just the end result of this stuff. But I would, you know, the, I would do the rounding for that one more specifically. But anyways. Okay. So the the rounding rule, it's not always round up if it's a decimal five. Um, you're better off to round so that it, the answer is even. So if it's even, you leave it. If it's odd, you round it up to even. Little pick, little extra picky rounding rule just to kind of pay attention to. And really, um, it's good to know that rule, but I'm actually kind of showing it more so that you can see why you get answers. Um, the answers in the, in the side of the book and in my solution sets are what they are, right? So you might have had 2.63, and then the answer says 2.6, you know, whatever, based on two, and you're like, why is that, right? So uh, unit analysis, good thing for us just to sort of be able to do if we, we ever asked to. Um, hint, hint, wink, wink, or whatever, right? But, you know, like basically do the units of this weird equation here, right? That's what that one is. Copy and paste over here. We're saying, you know, we solve for acceleration by just solving out all the, all the algebraically, all that stuff. And so the unit analysis of that would be like meters for displacement, and then that's meters per second, and then this is, you know, seconds, and this is seconds squared. And so we look and see what all this means, right? And so you say, okay, there's your meters and your meters per second and your seconds and your seconds squared. Uh, seconds and seconds cancel out. Meters and meters is still just meters. When you're doing a unit analysis, you don't um, do meters, take away meters, it's nothing. You just basically say, if I have a certain number of meters, take away a certain number of meters, my answer is in meters. Uh, so we're left with meters over seconds squared, which of course is the units of acceleration. So you can agree that, that that worked, your algebra worked. Sometimes it's a good check to see if you made a mistake too. So here's a uniform acceleration, you know, question to, to go through as a review. Um, I would 
I would I would recommend that you make sure you can do that from scratch and you have the solution set available as a confirmation, right? And so I would write this down on a separate page, do it yourself, and make sure you get the numbers that, that I get, of course. Oops, I'm trying to delete, but I'm moving it slightly. Um, so we got like a slowing down case. You know, like there are all these different cases we talked about, but in reality, in the end, you can just use the equations as we finally got to in, in grade 11. You're gonna look through these results and make sure this all makes sense to you, right? Your, your task is to review over the uniform acceleration stuff in detail. Um, so in this one here, obviously we can figure out like it comes to a stop, right? Because there's that implied in the question, it, come, it stops. Um, so that's implied that um, we have a zero velocity and calculations led to this time. And then you can choose from the equation sheet, this equation to figure out the displacement and so on, right? The VT graph is still good for understanding and communicating. So that's why it's asked there. And even confirm as a review question the area for the displacement. And then the idea of you know continuing to go in the other direction, you know, just to remind you that all this stuff exists, right? Oops, what did I just do? I don't want to do that. Undo. So um and then the follow a follow-up question here, you know, determine where it is, uh determine when it ends up a distance of 30 meters from its initial position. You know, so you're plugging in numbers to that thing. So I think uh, some problem solving. Oh yeah, this one, this one just has a little bit of problem solving because it's not, they're not just giving you numbers, plug it in and solve. This one, they're talking about like reaction time and so on. And so again, the next page is going to have a solution for this one, but again, it's another one for you to try and then look at the solution, make sure you can, can do that one. So this one, I have to get rid of the, the rectangles from this one before I post it. But this one just has numbers to carry you through the steps, the order of the steps that would probably be good for you to follow. And so you're going to find, even though we're saying that, you know, for the most part, we just sort of pick the equation and plug the numbers in, you're going to find the VT graph still very useful. Um, so this is the first example where the usefulness comes in. So you can picture like if there's a reaction time, someone is is stopping. Let me just help you remember what's going, see what's going on here. You've got a car driving along, and you you're going to apply the brakes and stop. But of course, it takes a little bit of time for you to apply the brakes, right? So graphically, you can picture you're going along with constant velocity until finally you realize, oh, geez, I gotta, you know, I gotta gotta stop. And so it takes a little bit of time when you realize to when you actually start to apply the brakes. So you actually travel. A distance traveling at constant velocity right in this graph then you start accelerating or you know accelerating the opposite direction obviously to slow down and come to a stop so this graph helps you see of course your area equation to do this you're gonna have this like reaction time distance and so on and anyways that comes together to calculate that information for you the time if you need help with the vector stuff you know try question number uh, 20 on 27 there's a solution for it but it's just talking about like a south and a north and a, what's your just what's your delta v like you know it's just basically the idea of the directions so just a whirlwind uh, reminder that you know of, of the kind of things we're talking about and then we get into this new stuff this catch-up question and so on so for now i want you to put in some legwork for getting the basics under control. Okay. So I think I'll be posting. Um, I think my file is the solution for all of the stuff. Obviously, you're only needing to look at the solution for the first part. Um, yeah. Any questions? I don't intend to spend days and days and days reviewing how to do this. I want you to just go through yourself and use the use the solutions as a so confirmation that you're on the right track based on what we've done before. So I'll post the equation sheet and I'll post the solutions and you've got some a little bit of review to do from grade 11. All right. So I'm going to turn my mic off, but I'll stay here for now. I'm just going to post things and all that. So I'll stop sharing my screen and and. Uh, all that.
Mr. Horn. Hello. Um, for the assignment thing, I'm like, what do you mean for question three when like there's no value? So do you just want us to plug in Q and A and like like yeah. I just don't know what you mean? By yeah. That. So instead of putting in a two and a three for those numbers, you put in literally Q's and A's. Um, so your answer for the you know your answer is going to be in terms of those variables instead of numbers. Okay. So uh, like. Go ahead. So for when I'm trying to find like the hypotenuse, I would just say like that distance is like a squared plus a yeah. squared equals x squared and then x you solve out for what x is, you know, and yeah, and then you end up using that for your distance and yeah. Okay. Yeah, all just algebraic. It's just that's kind of that's it's 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 a common thing in a grade 12 university course to sort of start to try and get students more willing to work in general like that um so yeah that's, that's a common question to see yeah. Um, Mr. Horn, I have a question about the assignment too. There you go. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, I have a question about one C. It's saying like that it says describe the work done in moving Q two from an infinite distance away to the two centimeter location, and when like. I kind of have it like written out like in the math way because we've done it that way before, but I'm kind of a bit confused about how like to describe it. So the infinite location thing um, is not something you specifically have to do, right? Um, if you're yeah. looking at energy between two charges, it's automatically implied that that's the energy they have relative to an infinite distance away. Um, if you did do it, um, yeah, if you did do it, you would say like final energy at the new location, subtract the initial energy at infinity. And so you'd be doing like divide by infinity in that second part, right? So I don't really want you to actually do that. I want you just to sort of calculate the energy between them using the equation for energy between two point charges, but talk about the idea that, that that's the energy, you know, it has in the system in comparison to what they'd have if they're an infinite distance apart. 
so like when it's like the work done is that wasn't there like an example or something in the um in our lessons where it was like where it equaled zero if it was at infinity is that like the same thing yeah um let me i'm gonna start up a notebook lesson here and i'll show you what was that is that you or me uh, that was me i think i got an email it just came through because my speaker's on wow it gave me a heart attack why does that sound? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the first question is just about point charges, right? Energy between them. Um, yeah. Give me a second here for my computer to start up. I think it's going to crash on me. It's working pretty slow here. So we've got uh, when I got to share my screen. Is so slow. All right, can you see the screen there? Yeah. So if you've got a Q that's here and a Q that's there, obviously we have like a E E equals you know K Q Q over our business for the energy, right? Um, that's the energy they have because of the system, or they're like R one, right? Um, so that energy at that spot, you could look at it as like. Oh, well, in order to, if this one is like fixed in place and you're bringing the other one in from infinity, then yeah, there'd be like work done. There'd be like force equals work, to, or, sorry, bah, work equals force times distance. Right? And so you'd have delta D, you know, you're moving from infinity into this spot and, and the concept is all there, right? But the idea is that we have zero joules of energy out here. Um, and then this would be like E um, initial, this would be final. And this KQQ over R, uh, over R stuff on its own would be equivalent to saying like, oh, well, what's the change in the energy here? We'd have E final minus E initial, right? And so it would work out to be this thing literally. So I'm just gonna put a star here, right? And then subtract this one where it's like KQQ over infinity which of course just becomes zero, right? So the idea of the, the energy that you get by moving from an infinite distance away to the location, right, is embedded in this equation itself, right? It really does mean that. It means the energy it has in comparison to being when they're an infinite distance apart. Does that help? A little bit. So when it's the um, when it's the work done and it's the e final minus the e initial, then is it just like does that just mean the work done is similar to the like the original, just like the e e? Yeah, I, I would use a stronger word than similar. I would say it's it's exactly this. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Like if you look at if you look at what this thing is here, it's it's this thing is literally exactly what that is, right? So basically, you're saying like the the energy you have in the system right is is equal to the work that was done in order to bring it bring the system together from an infinite distance away okay thank you i just wasn't sure how to explain it that really helps thanks yeah no problem that's what i'm here for good stuff keep saving stuff here export as Forgot to uh, pause and check attendance while the lesson was going on. <laughs> Did anybody notice who was away? I think everyone was here except for Dawson. Okay, that's what I kind of was hoping or thinking was the truth going to be the case, but yeah. I don't know if you care, but I think the recording's still on. Oh, that is probably good to turn off. <laughs> 